Hello everyone. Welcome back. So this was uh, in my feed and it's already started. So let's just, let's stop that now. This is how did two Americans wipe out a whole German company? I don't know. With guns, bombs. That, that's that's my guess. That's we'll see. As planned in Operation Overlord's American landings on the Coutantin Peninsula, two U.S. Army Airborne Divisions, the 82nd and 101st, were to drop behind the assault sector of Utah Beach before dawn on D-Day and support the landings of the American 4th Infantry Division on the beach. The tasks and objectives allocated to the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions were subdivided into various missions. The overall objective for the Airborne Forces on D-Day were to secure key bridges, roads, towns, and strategic choke points that could prevent possible German counterattacks on Utah Beach. Have you ever thought about what it was like to take part in operations such as D-Day? Well, you can take part in similar battles by playing our sponsor, War Thunder. It's by far the most comprehensive V- Thanks, War Thunder. I've never wondered. Major General Maxwell D. Taylor's 101st Airborne Division a well-trained division that would see its first action was to jump into Normandy on the night of D-Day alongside the veterans of the 82nd. Parachuting into Normandy to the west and southwest of Utah Beach at drop zones A, C and D, it was the 101st Airborne's objectives for Mission Albany to ensure that the Utah Beach landings by the 4th Infantry went smoothly and without heavy resistance or possible counterattacks by the Germans from inland. The flooded fields along the Douve River and the farmland behind Utah Beach created a series of elevated, narrow causeway roads. It would be the 101st job to secure the four causeway exits off Utah, which would be the only avenue for the 4th Infantry to get off the beach. The causeways were designated numbers 1 through 4, and divided amongst the 502nd and 506th Parachute Infantry Regiments. Colonel George Van Horn Mosley Jr.'s 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, along with the attached guns of the 377th Parachute Field Artillery Battalion, would jump over Drop Zone A, just to the west of the northern beach exits, Causeways 3 and 4. Each of the three parachute battalions of the 502nd had a separate mission that had to be met by the time of the beach landings at 0630 hours. The 1st Battalion under Lieutenant Colonel Patrick F. Cassidy was to secure two objectives. One objective was to secure a series of houses west of Utah Beach and eliminate a garrison of troops from a German artillery battery along the coast. This objective was designated as the WXYZ complex. Planners feared that the garrison of the WXYZ complex, which had an unknown number of troops, would be able to effectively mount a counterattack against the beach landing forces if given time to prepare. That is why the WXYZ complex was so crucial to the operation's success. The second objective for Cassidy's 1st Battalion was the small village of Foucaville, located just north of Utah Beach. Foucaville was the northernmost village of the entire landing area for the invasion and had to be captured in order to prevent a German counterattack coming from the north, from Cherbourg. Meanwhile, the 2nd Battalion of the 502nd under Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Chapuis would secure a German coastal artillery battery 
in front of the village of Saint-Martin-de-Varaville, directly off causeway exit 3. It was believed that this coastal battery could jeopardize the landings if operational, and Chapuis men had to eliminate it in order to ensure successful landings on the beachhead. During all of this, 3rd Battalion of the 502nd, led by Lieutenant Colonel Robert G. Cole, would secure causeway exits 3 and 4 and link up with elements of the 4th Infantry when the landings commenced. The 3rd Battalion would also be kept in regimental reserve in case they were needed to support the other two battalions in their tasks. At 048 hours on June 6, 1944, the first wave of C-47 troop transport planes carrying the 2nd Battalion of the 502nd arrived over the drop zone. It was the first wave of a ceaseless airdrop that would continue in battalion intervals for the next three hours. Heavy flak and anti-aircraft fire peppered the skies, forcing many of the planes off course against the low-flying clouds, and leading to many paratroopers being misdropped, sometimes miles away from their designated DZs. All listening to you, bud. Shut your, shut your mouth. Shut your face. Shut up. Shut up. No one cares. Shut up. And back to the video. All through the night, the paratroopers of the 101st and 82nd, many scattered across the Normandy countryside and nowhere near their intended positions, would form into ad hoc units and wreak havoc on German cohesion and communications. By dawn, many objectives for the airborne had still yet to be achieved, but with the landing starting at 0630 hours, there was little choice but to press on and accomplish whatever tasks they could. By early morning, Colonel Cassidy had set up his battalion command post in a detached house on the road leading towards the WXYZ complex. With no word on the capture of Fucarville, Cassidy shifted his attention towards his primary objective at WXYZ. To accomplish this mission, Cassidy looked to the capable Staff Sergeant Harrison C. Summers of B Company and placed him in command of a 15-man patrol made up of men from various units. The paratroopers now placed under Summers' command were unfamiliar with their new NCO. Summers himself didn't know a single man he would be leading into action, or what their fighting capabilities were. As the column of paratroopers moved towards the complex, his men felt uneasy. There was little cover around them, except for the lines of hedgerows along the road. At 0900 hours, Summers reached the first house and turned to his men, giving them hand signals to direct the attack. However, the troopers were unsure of Summer's leadership, and a few even kept away from the house. German fire suddenly erupted from the sides of the first house, and Summer's men hit the dirt, taking cover behind low ditches on the roadside. Oh, no. Deciding to lead by example, Summers crawled forward through the adjacent hedgerow, got up and slung his Thompson submachine gun across his shoulder before kicking down the house door. Four of the stunned Germans were mowed down where they stood. Survivors from the building fled across the road. The first house was now clear. Tell you what, if you're unsure about your commander and he just does something like that, what are you going to do? You're going to continue to hide? You can't do that. He just demonstrated that, you know, hey, look, I have a job to do. I'm here to fight. Whew. That puts pressure on you. And if, if that's what you were looking for, you're looking for somebody who's going to lead by example, then you're following him. Summers came back through the hedge and signaled to his men. 
but they refused to advance any further. The frustrated Sergeant Summers carried on with his mission, moving diagonally across the road towards the second house. Here he was joined by Private William A. Burt, armed with a light machine gun. The two paratroopers cleared the second house with little difficulty and moved on to attack the third structure. By now, the Germans were responding with machine pistol fire at the two men attacking the compound. Private Burt trained his machine gun on the Germans and cut them down as they moved from cover around the buildings. Wow. Summers moved on to the third house and smashed open the door. Inside, six Germans were mowed down by a single sweep of Summers' Tommy gun. Damn. While Summers moved on to the next house, a captain from the 82nd who had arrived on the scene joined him in the assault. However, before the captain managed to move 20 yards, he was shot through the head by a sniper. Oh, wow. Summers never even had the chance to get the officer's name. Over the next half hour, Summers and Bert moved house to house, clearing five more buildings of the WXYZ complex. Another man from Summers Patrol now summed up the courage to aid them, Private John Kamen, armed with a carbine. While Bert provided machine gun support, the other two switched from house to house, Kamen covering Summers with his carbine while Summers rushed the doors with his Thompson. The two took no pr- I'm starting to think Summers is a little crazy, actually. Look, there's a great line in Band of Brothers where one of the guys says, who is it? It's uh, Lieutenant Spears. I think he's talking to Blythe. And if you've seen the show, you know, that's one thing. Blythe, I think, just came back from sick bay, according to the show. He was just a sick bay. Uh, I'm trying to remember. He was in a combat situation. He panicked and he said he went blind. And so he went back there. And sometime later, he tells um, Spears. Spears is out walking around. People were scared. The Americans were scared of Spears because supposedly he just gunned people down for no reason. And he, Blythe, tells Spears, um, when I was in that hole, I panicked. And, you know gunfire was coming, bombs were going off and I panicked and I couldn't fight and Spears says to him Blythe the one thing you gotta realize is that you're already dead you just you just don't know it yet and I guess that's kind of the minds that you have to have going into it into a battle where I'm probably gonna die but I can't let that stop me from doing what I have to do. I don't want to die. But if I go into it knowing that I will die, maybe that's not the correct mindset, but if you go into it thinking, I, I'll probably die, but this is my mission. I don't want to die, but it is what it is. I understand that, I signed up for it, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, that. that that Spears told that to Blythe. Now, whether that happens in real life, I don't know. But it's just a great thing. I mean, it's a terrible thing to hear. You'd be scared to death to hear someone say that to you. But, you know, you got to deal with it somehow. Prisoners in the close quarters fighting. When Summers kicked open the door of the large 6th building, he found a squad of 15 Germans sitting around the dining table, eating breakfast. Firing from the hip, Summers sprayed them with 44 caliber bullets before they had the chance to get out of their seats. 30 Germans had been killed in these five buildings. The three men next gathered to assault the final structure, a large double-storied barracks house with thick stone walls. By now, more paratroopers were joining in the attack their morale raised by the sight of three men clearing five buildings. 
After moving through a hedgerow, the group found themselves facing a 75-yard open orchard between their position and the structure. When they moved up to prepare their assault, a German sniper opened fire on them from somewhere to their right. Four of Summer's men were killed by the sniper fire, another four wounded. As the group moved closer to the barracks house against the sniper fire, Bert fired tracer rounds from his machine gun into a nearby haystack, lighting it ablaze. The fire soon engulfed the building's adjacent shed, which was being used as an ammunition store. Oh no! Munitions began exploding, and with that, the Germans inside the farmhouse rushed outside to escape getting caught in the blasts. About 30 of them were gunned down by Summers and his men as they attempted a mad dash across the orchard. With the capture of the final farmhouse, the WXYZ complex was secure. Around 80 Germans had been killed at the cost of about 10 Americans killed or wounded. Wow. It was around 1200 hours when Staff Sergeant Summers sat down on the side of the road and lit a cigarette. Summers' patrol, but for the most part just Summers and Bert, had single-handedly wiped out an entire company-sized garrison of German troops. D-Day was far from over, but one of the 502nd's key objectives for Mission Albany had now been carried out successfully. Cassidy would soon be able to shift his attention toward the town of Fukarville to the north. For his actions in clearing out the WXYZ complex, Harrison Summers would be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the US Army's second highest decoration for valor. Deserved. Play War Thunder on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox. Wow. Just. People who just. They just do it in those situations. I just. It's amazing to me because I don't know if I could. But uh, it's a good video. This is uh, History March, by the way, which you, you kind of knew. Okay, I'm going to end this video here. Um, like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Have a good night.